devices. So as part of the Wi-Fi, we really are doing a lot right now in this area. We kind of rebooted a, a technology that's been there since probably 2007, where we're really trying to say, hey, this is some of the new things we can do with location. And so today we're going to talk about some of the, <coughs> the three new types of capabilities that we've added with location that have just come up now with CMX 10.2. So CMX 10.2 is sort of our relabeling of our older technology to kind of call the Mobility Services Engine. The Mobility Services Engine is going to continue to be our hardware platform. The Mobility Services Engine 3365 replaces the 3355 that had been out for a long time. It's got now 20 CPUs and 64 gigs of memory, a really beefy server. We literally relabeled the uh, UCS server to be able to come up with our new, our new 3365 server. And that's going to be the hardware engine. And on top of that engine, we're going to drive a couple of really great pieces of software. The first piece of software that we're driving is this new CMX 10.2. And that, and that CMX 10.2, we're very happy to announce, went on Cisco.com on Monday this week, thanks to several of you guys here who were participated in our beta programs that tried to make it really great. Call it Sam, maybe, as one of the, uh, the guys who uh, was really diligent in providing great feedback. I hope we answered and, and you know, provided some of the, um, the requests, hey, if we could just do this, and we really kept, kept on going. And so it was kind of a little bit of an extension beta, but we really we got over a thousand different um, feedback, individual feedbacks. We even had a little prize where you know the people who uh, who provided the most feedback got some uh, uh, iPads. Fortunately, it was a random number; you didn't win. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, we really did. We really did take to heart what we needed to do in order to make CMX 10.2 uh, really the great product. Uh, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about the location capabilities we've added in 10.2. So. <laughs> There's really three different kind of sort of uh, advancements that we've created to location. First is uh, basically the old way of using location was you put an access point here, put an access point here, put an access point here. <coughs> They would then do, hey, inside of clean air, uh, radio frequencies uh, signals uh, degrade by 3 dB for every double the length, right? So we would know that this device, because it's seen at minus 70 dB, um, uh, is about you know 40 feet from this point, right? And so that'd be a circle 40 feet around this one AP. And then they do the same thing for the second AP, same thing for the third AP. And so I'd get, hey, I'm 50 feet away from this AP, I'm 70 feet away from, uh, 30 feet away from this AP, AP A, B, and C. And then I draw a sort of a, hey, the device must be somewhere in this circle. So that one of the great uses of that you know, trigonometry that you learned back in high school was, hey, I'm you know, 40 feet from here, 50 feet from here, 30 feet from here, where's about the, the location? That's been the historical method of doing triangulation based on radio, RSSI received, uh, received signal strengths. And that's uh, a great technology, but one of the things that is important for this technology to work is the uh, packet has to be heard by all the different APs, right? A, B, A, B, and C. Well, to do that, well, packets that are received by all the APs have to be broadcast packets, right? You can't do a unicast. If this guy is having a nice uh, a fat conversation, 802.11ac with just AP A, AP B is not going to be on that channel. So it was only limited to broadcast packets. These silly iPhone devices keep broadcasting less and less broadcast packets because they want to conserve energy, really only talking to the person that they're really having that conversation with. So they're doing less and less broadcast packets. So our first innovation was what's called fast locate local mode. So fast locate is all about eight. <laughs> was all about saying, hey, uh, instead of just using broadcast packets, we are now going to use data packets. And how do we do that is make a bit of a scientific sacrifice, saying, hey, APB is now going to have to go off channel for a little bit of time. And instead of serving clients, da, 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 it's going to go and listen for MAC addresses that, AP, that, uh, that may be of interest and may be connected to APA. And so that's, that's the enhanced local mode. That was the same technology we used for uh, RRM to be able to uh, really optimize what's going on in the air. Now we've enabled that as an enhanced local mode so you get fast locate so that instead of getting in broadcast mode, you know, broadcast packets may occur once per minute, right? We now have the ability to use data packets and this guy's gonna happen to be on the same channel as this guy and send us the packets to really generate probably about, about six per minute. So once every 10 seconds. So instead of having one update now and then 
I don't send another probe packet until maybe I'm in the lobby. I can now send a probe packet. I can send a data packet now. If I'm connected, I send another data packet as I sort of get the calf and then another one. So I get a lot, I get more updates. It doesn't improve the location calculation methods. It's still, hey, I see you at 70 dB from this one and 50 dB from this one and 30 dB from this one. I use RSSI to triangulate, but we now do it based on data packets. And so that's a, um, an enhancement that has come in our um, wireless LAN controller 8.1 MR3 as well as our CMX 10.2 so we'll be able to use enhanced local mode uh, this is actually going to be in CMX 10.2.1 CMX 10.2.1 and you know we don't normally talk about futures but this is going to be released in probably about three weeks so we're just doing our final little uh, touches on our the idea of enhanced local mode fast locate and enhanced local mode so um can you tell me again what kind of packets is the AP actually sending to? to is it so the AP does, is just receiving packets. This second AP is going off channel and listening to the channel that this that this client is on mm. and saying, listen to any data packets. And it says, hey, any any data packets that happen to be in the air at that time with this MAC address, I'm going to put into a message and tell the MSC that, hey, I've heard this data packet at this strength. Okay. What's um, that off channel cycle time? Uh, the off channel cycle time is 75 milliseconds. So we try to, and that's, and that's one of the last things that we're tweaking. I'll say it now, we may actually go to 125. It's, it, that's the one where you gotta build a little bit of a sacrifice, right? Because for those 75 milliseconds, I'm off channel, so I, can't, I don't wanna miss any heartbeats, so I can't be larger than 100. So there, that's kind of the last sort of uh, tweak that we wanna do as to how much off cycle time. If the, if the air is not very busy, it doesn't really matter, right? If I go off for 75 milliseconds, there's nobody talking, it's no big deal. It's really in a very congested environment that you can't go off channel very long. And that um, functionality doesn't require anything on the client. To yeah, it doesn't require anything on the client. Doesn't require anything but software on the on the uh, controllers to be able to to change that um, uh, um, scheduling cycle to say, hey, when do I go off channel and listen to these uh, another capabilities? So that's a fast locate. The second enhancement that we're looking at is sort of everything is old is new again, which is the idea of. Presence. So presence analytics is all about, hey, what if I have a really small network and I just want to know, uh, what if I only have this as my network, right? One AP <laughs> uh, at a barber shop and I want to know how long people stay there. Meraki's had this forever. Many of our competitors have had this forever. But Cisco was like, no, 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 you want to do location, you want to triangulate across three, and you want to... And we realized, no, there are certain cases where you don't have prime, and you don't have more than one access points, maybe one or maybe two access points in a location, but we still want to have gather that great data we're getting about you know, people who walked by, the number of pro packets they saw there, people who actually stayed in the environment. So as part of CMX 10.2, we now have presence. So CMX 10.2 with presence is the idea of kind of peg counting, right? Anytime this client sends a probe packet, very Meraki-like, says, oh, I heard this probe packet, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add another, uh, I know that this the, the device was here at this time. I'm gonna know this device was here at this time. I'm going to add both an API that says, hey, I heard this device. Um, I can't tell you exactly where it is, I just know I've heard it at minus 70 dB, so I'm somewhere within my, my range of it. Right? I, I define that device as either a passerby, somebody more than uh, a configured um, dB strength away it, or I configure it as a visitor, somebody who was heard by a strong dB, let's say minus 70, and I saw him for five minutes. And then there's a third level which says, I've heard somebody, but I heard him at minus 100, I'm just going to ignore that data. So you have those three sets of data, and they're all configurable in, your, in, in the GUI that says, hey, is this an ignore, is this a passerby, or is this a visitor? So we send out that notification stream, very similar to the Meraki notification stream that said, hey, we've heard one of these three types of devices. This is pretty important in that there's um, no requirement for prime, <coughs> no requirement for maps, can be done on a single AP, and um, because it's licensed per AP and there's no server license, this is just 75 bucks per AP, or sorry, 150 bucks per AP. 225 for the, per AP. For the analytics. 
So if you actually were to set up a server and point your, your little tiny AP or 2500 or point one of the 1800s at this, just for 150 bucks you can start getting analytics. It's a really a great low end solution. Because this is offered at the low end, most of the work is getting that server up. So we're looking at a couple of different ways. One is, you know, take a look at cmxcisco.com uh, as a website, cmxcisco.com as one way of maybe um, providing some services. But we're also looking at, you know, uh, many different uh, service providers or partners saying, hey, we'll host that little PC for you. Or, because it's available as a VMware, you know, you'll put it on any, any small server to be able to, to start gathering basic presence analytics. And what you'll see when we'll demonstrate basic presence analytics is you'll get things like that you can't even get with video cameras, like repeat visitors, a really important metric for some, for some types of stores. You know, video camera counting is great, you know, some of that old stuff that would say, hey, you know, this number of people walked through my trip line, but how many were repeats? What's kind of the repeat percentage? Because I know how MAC addresses, I can tell are people coming there daily, weekly, monthly. Yep. Do you get any more um, or better analytical data if you have more APs on site? Yeah, what you actually, you, you do, you get better coverage as to say, hey, I've got four APs on site, I kind of, I can, can change that zones, right? I can now say, I'm going to define an entire global site, but I can say how many people came to the middle, how many people came to the left, how many people came to the right. So I can, I, the additional data, an, data analytics is I can group them and, or I can go to single uh, APs and get and data you on you still it. have around that 10 meter. Yeah, the, the, we're not, we're not um, doing anything about the algorithms. We're not um, merging the algorithm, but we are, we are uh, giving you a hierarchical capabilities if you have more than one AP at your location. Is that license cost 150 annually, or is it a one-time? Oh, one time. Okay. One time, you buy your SASU, you buy your support, so that you can upgrade to our, our wonderful CMX 10.3. <laughs> but 150 bucks per AP is a one-time fee, and that's the, li the global list price. Um, for the uh, even lower price of 75 bucks per AP, you can get just the um, API feeds out of it. So you install this, and you, for 75 bucks, you can get an API feed that says, hey, uh, this MAC address was here at this time. And there's all kinds of oh, you know, uh, interesting tweaks people have done, even on home API. Keys, right with you know, if, you, if you're a geek and you run at 2500 at home like myself I can know when my mom <laughs> comes because I know her Mac address and you know maybe I don't go home <laughs> um, <laughs> Wow! Uh, there's all kinds of little interesting ones you could run uh, uh, at, at, at small ends and so that's really what we've done with presence analytics right the idea with uh, very small solution sites they can work this but another part of presence that's really been helpful is a very large site with lots and lots of stores so imagine if I had 2,000 stores each of them having only a couple of APs how do you do analytics there's not enough mapping to be able to do a math for every store this is a great way to be able to say hey I've got a thousand stores I want to compare store number one to store number two to store number three what percentage of people walked by versus came in a metric that I could compare even across different types of sizes of stores. I could say, hey, how come your, you know, maybe your signage is not great because you only got 20% of the people who are walking by coming in and this other store is doing something better and they get 30% of the people walking by coming in. Or I could say, you know, in your store in, uh, in New York, we're only see, we're seeing the average dwell time to be about 30 minutes and your sales are kind of low, whereas the store in Louisiana has a dwell time of 40 minutes and their sales are doing better. So we can provide those types of comparison metrics between stores at a large in deployment for presence. And that was one of our big, our, our big beta trials was a large retailer that had many, many stores, put, you know, but only one or two APs per store. And they're able to do this on a central server. And the thing about um, presence is it's very lightweight because again, it's just peg counting. Um, we can have a very high number of stores that are, are able to do this. So hundreds of thousands, hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of clients on a single server. And that's the capability with presence. The third big um, location and location change that we've done in 10.2, 10.2.1 is the one that has gotten the most press, the one that won the award at the uh, 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 at um, uh, Interop, Interop Japan, and has won the Cisco Pioneering Award. It's called hyperlocation. So hyperlocation is this. And so we'll actually pass these around just to show them <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to see. And we'll, uh, so this is the new hyperlocation AP. Um, it is a uh, 
more. An, on, an enhancement, an add-on to your existing 3700s or 3600s, you add two modules. You add a module in the back and this circular antenna. And this is where we've been doing a lot of research and development to create this. And so this has been, you know, from the very first sort of uh, scientific papers as to whether or not a phase array antenna was possible at this size, which was done in 2007, to our very first prototypes, probably that had um, that used regular antennas, and we wired them out to come up with a with a, a, a synthetic phase array on a piece of cardboard. To our first to second prototypes, it's been about five years in development. This um, uh, is about to be coming out. We've got some of our last beta customers who are bringing up the trials. We've been able to really get down to uh, one meter accuracy in locations that are above, the, uh, you know, sort of APs under the ceiling tiles, uh, sort of standard AP locations with 50 feet placement. So you put APs 50 feet from apart from each other. HAP covers about 2,500 square feet, 50 feet apart. You get line of sight to three APs. You're able to be able to come up with a location down to one meter accuracy. And how it does that is it's got this phase array. It's got these 32 antennas, four different subsections. Each antenna is either a dual band, five gigahertz and 2.4, or a single band 2.4. Uh, sorry, a single band five gigahertz radio. So there's 16 2.4s and 32 five gigahertz radios. They will scan the air for any associated wireless clients. So that's what we can provide the location down to one meter for associated, meaning you've got to be connected to the Wi-Fi <laughs> and you've got to be um, a wireless client. We have you know, our next set of um, software updates will assign this capability to things like tags and things like unassociated clients. We'll figure out how we can get better location for that. But our first version is associated clients. So if anyone wants the uh, clear version to see all the you wonderful... You know we all want the clear version. <laughs> and, uh, exactly. oh, you can you see it. giving and, it out? <laughs> and so, yeah, we expect that uh, to... Uh, to uh, you know, people will start to try to copy that technology. Um, but this will be the first ones. We're running the first set of uh, large um, uh, production manufacturing runs right now. Only associated clients? Uh, only associated clients are the, on our first set of software. So our CMX 10.1, uh, 10.2.1 software. So it requires a couple different things. You require CMX 10.2.1 to be able to take all this information and create an algorithm that says where it is. It requires the wireless LAN controller 8.1MR3. Oh, okay. It requires Prime 3.0. Right, that's well, why do I need a new Prime? I'm just putting the maps. I gotta know the orientation. So when you look at that AP, I've got these 32 antennas. Which is antenna zero? Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? I now need to add this new, new set of information into my Prime to be able to come up with a map that says, which is antenna zero? You've also got to be much more diligent on your location placing it. When you place it in prime, you just can't slap it up. Yeah, I think it's about over there, but that ceiling tile? No, you really got to get the right height and you got to get the right X, Y coordinates because if you don't, that sort of extrapolates the error. Right? If I'm trying to get one meter accuracy, but the, but the AP is three meters away from what I really tell it is in the mathematical models, I'm not able to get that accuracy. So that's an important part of our things that we've learned as part of our beta program is that you've got to get that. Uh, that's the uh, clear and the translucent. The final one is completely painted white, just because <laughs> people are going, well, why do I see it? No, the final one is completely painted white. Um, the, so, so again, this hyperlocation usually is based on the angle of arrivals. So it says, hey, what's the angle that I've seen this at? Uh, I see this from three different APs. I then can come up with a triangulated, uh, uh, angulated actual uh, angulation uh, to come up with the, the location down to plus or minus one meter. Uh, it's the same sort of, uh, it's kind of similar to the uh, concept of um, RSSI feed loss, but instead of providing a, just a, hey, this is seen at 70 dBs, we provide what's called this um, uh, uh, Egan values that, that say, hey, I believe it's seen by this antenna. I believe it's seen by antenna 17 on this one first. I believe it's seen by antenna 9 here. I believe it's seen by antenna uh, 22 here. That means I get particular angles from each of those antennas because I know which um, antenna is. You know, this one's at zero, this one's at 90, this one's at 180. I know the antenna it's seen first at. I can provide a direction and I get three different directions. Then I can provide that um, location down to one meter accuracy. Is, is that self-learning so the RM learns it after you mount them or do you have to 
plug it in when you mount them and give it very specific. You have to plug it in when you mount them and give it the very specific set of data that says this AP is at 10 feet height, this zero angle is pointed this way, and uh, the XY coordinates on the map is how, here. How do you, what's the installer need to give back for the feedback to get that into control? So what the installer needs to give back is the correct location based on the prime map, right? That says, hey, this is, this is the XY coordinates of where I installed the AP. It needs to give back the height <coughs> and it needs to give back the orientation that says um, In, this, this AP was pointed with its mark. There's just like a little mark on it. You're gonna have to add that step to the AP that says this mark was pointed um, east, west, north, or south. So that's the additional data point that you need to be able to get accurately uh, entered into Prime in order to come up with these locations. So it, do, it does take a little bit more work. Uh, probably on installing an AP, um, it may be, you know, 30 to 50% more time to get it right <laughs> than, than it was before when you kind of slapped them up. Um, some people say it's even longer than that because people uh, have historically been slapping up APs and not really caring about the location. Uh, if you care about location, you've got to get the, uh, the, in, uh, the uh, incoming data correct. But once you get it correct, you get a great prize at the end, and that great prize is hyperlocation down to being able to get it to plus or minus one meter accuracy. Um, can I can I call out Sam real quick? Sure. <laughs> Instead of whispering to you, so you had a picture of you of an installation that you have where you have this mounted. How what's been your experience with it? Yeah, so we're we're very uh, we're very involved in the early field trials. Yeah, um, and we're absolutely seeing some of the proclaimed um, you know uh, improvements in accuracy, fidelity. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's uh, you know I think what Daryl said. Uh, um, it's easy to say and sometimes difficult to do. Is you have to be very precise about where your APs are at. Okay. You have to know the elevation of the AP, the orientation of the AP, and and very 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 accurately where that AP is at on a map. And they absolutely have to be mounted to the suspended ceiling. Mm, yeah, it cannot be mounted story. above the ceiling. Yeah. We, we, End of story. Yeah. Do not pass go. Uh, which some of those things sound like they're easy to do, and it's but you know the, the real world is is that some problems. some people have a, have a challenge doing that. So I think if you can get all those things lined up, it, you know, if if your business needs are one meter accuracy, you can do it, and it's possible. Yeah, yeah. it works. Yeah. It works. What, what yeah. do those halos run? Thanks. Uh, the the price of the uh, uh, the uh, access point is um, it's the regular sort of thirty seven hundred. The uh, module is in two parts. It's a thousand bucks in total. So five hundred bucks for the for the embedded module and five hundred bucks for the antenna. Uh, the embedded module does a bit of standalone work. It can act as a BLE beacon and as a wireless security module for scanning uh, 802.11ac, which didn't exist before, as well as the regular bands. So 500 bucks for the module, 500 bucks for the So antenna. that basically doubles the cost of your AP. Does it lower the number of APs necessary? Because normally for location, okay, yeah. you have to add... Yeah. You know, and, and, and we've had, absolutely, we've had that question. We haven't uh, gone to that level yet. Uh, we're doing that some in our labs, but in our first, require, uh, first recommendations to the field is about the same number of APs, one AP for 2,500 square feet for location. Um, what we uh, had uh, expected is people will, for location, normally had a bunch of APs on the edge and then moved another set of APs on the inside. That's something we think will be lowered, but we are not making that change in recommendation yet. I do expect that change to be recommendation, but we just need to have more deployments to make that. But so, scientifically, that's, the, that's what the math says it should be able to. So real quick, back to um, Sam. Sam's deployment. Are you playing with anything on a wall mount? I know it's not supposed yeah. to be done. No. <laughs> no. oh, what, no. What's the story there? Um, so we have our next generation of antennas that are coming out. Again, the way this is designed is it's got a what's called the DARF connector, so it's got a, 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 a connector for the antennas. That's why we specifically didn't put made it as two separate models, so you could actually have external antennas. So we have our uh, our research into our completed external antennas, which will be which we're getting off the production line in December. So that's what will be the plan for external uh, wall-mounted antennas to be able to look down a long wall and say what's going on. Our first APs are great for office environments, 12 foot ceilings, 50 feet apart, <laughs> associated clients. <laughs> Is there a plan and process to create a beauty ring to hold all of this? 
like the, the AP, what is it, bracket three? Yeah, the AP bracket two. So this one works on the AP bracket two. Uh, being able to put them nicely in the ceiling, we've got the AP bracket three. We've already sort of um, worked with our provider to, 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 stretch to, 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 stretch that, to stretch that beauty ring out so that it can be placed up on the ceiling tiles and not look so... Um, Obtrusive. Without making it sound like a marketing pitch, can you talk a little bit about AP requirements for supporting this? Right, Because I'm a big right. fan of modularity, yeah. and, <laughs> and, and people have been beating up on that for a really long time. Right. But, I mean, you know, how old can you go back from an AP perspective? So you can go back all the way to the 3600. So that's a four-year-old AP that you can come back and, and uh, add this hyperlocation module to. So that was why we uh, enabled these, uh, these modular APs, is that you can now go back to any of those customers that have those 3600s and do this. It's 36s and 3700s. And this is the, this is, you know, the second or third great module, right? The 802.11ac uh, module is one example. The security clean air module and this advanced hyperlocation modules are all about why you make that choice for uh, modular APs, but that's not marketing. That's, <laughs> that's just why you have to do it. And so I think, I think we made a really great set of modules here. Um, and this is really going to um, provide a distinction in the industry, right? The, the industry, and we we're talking to a lot of big players, just hasn't made this research and development, right? This is not Qualcomm chipsets. It's not bright. There's no chipsets so you can do this. This is sort of pure kind of R&D and that we, we think that we are going to push the envelopes. But once it's done, then we hope to be able to get it into chipsets and then people like, you know, other APs can start to take advantage of it. Yeah. Like some of your other module-based systems who got replaced with a integrated AP, is this on the roadmap? That, the that sounds version? like it would make sense. <laughs> I'm not going to discuss roadmaps, <laughs> but the idea of doing the research and development, cutting edge, pushing it onto a module, and then figuring out how it can be embedded into all of our APs to make them better than the industries, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but I didn't <laughs> provide any roadmap. Does it um, require AC power? Uh, it does require eight hundred eleven uh, POE plus. It's about uh, about that eighteen watts. Uh, yeah, eighteen watts, eighteen nineteen watts. Um, okay. So it's it's in the standard POE plus. So it doesn't require any special, but it does require full POE plus. All right. So now the last thing I wanted to do. Uh, so those are the three big parts of hyperlocation that we've introduced. One is. Um, you can start doing location based on data packets, right? That was the big thing, which is enhanced local mode that's coming in CMX 10.2.1. The second was presence, right? We used to have to have a map and prime. Now you can just do it for a very low price, start to do locations and get some basic information. And the third is hyperlocation. So now I just wanted to show a little quick demo of uh, the software. I want to ask a quick question. Do you think that we'll ever get back to where we're adding the APs and looking <coughs> from prime to the MSE? Because now they've kind of gone away from Yeah, we've now. kind of bifurcated. So um, in, so in Prime, to be able to see the APs, uh, to be able to see uh, interferers when in the Prime maps, is going to be a new function in, in a, um, Prime 3.1. Okay. So that's already on the roadmap. That is an announced roadmap item that we're going to be able to open up the API so that they, you can go back to just seeing your, your devices in Prime. Right now, you see your devices in the MSC, and we'll show you how you can see them. All right, let's uh, go over here and see if I can this up. All right, so what you're looking at here is the uh, is the press. <laughs> it's a big black screen. <laughs> it is pretty. <laughs> okay, okay. The telepresence. So. Okay, oh Google. <laughs> Come on. Hey Siri, turn on the screen. <laughs> hey Siri. So I have this up and running. We'll start. We'll just plug this back in again. Should the screen be on uh, now? If there's nothing plugged in. <laughs> and I'm just going to plug the screen back in. Apply Windows updates and reboot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, see if there's an obvious power button. Did you check your TCP IP oh, settings? Live. There we go. There we go. There we go. Yay. Steven proximity sensor. Way to go. Oh, the proximity <laughs> sensor. He walked right by it. There you yeah. go. And it woke up. Except it's not showing your thing. All right. Is there a remote? It's disconnected by. I have no idea. <laughs> oh, this may be the remote. Does it have any? Who's our, uh, our team that is going to There's no remote. It should auto switch. Or try. Try. Just disconnect it and reconnect okay. it? 
if I remember dying on life support and I'm not responding, <laughs> just unplug it and plug it back in. See that <laughs> How long should we wait before we plug it back in? <laughs> yeah. yeah, wait a day or two and uh, see what happens. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> unplug, plug it back in. All right. So um, what we've got there, uh, again, because of the resolution, this is a uh, pretty um, low resolution screens. But I'll show you what um, some of the things that are possible. So first of all, the CMX 10.2 analytics allows you to see things like the number of visitors, the number of repeat visitors in an environment. Uh, you've got these sort of uh, 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 um, uh, what we call an insight bar at the top there that says the total number of visitors was 119. What was your top department? Um, on a larger screen, you'll be able to get, gather all this information. Your average dwell time is 40 minutes. Um, a correlation report that says in the school area, which is an area of my uh, lab, where do people also seen? So 48% of 87% uh, of them are also seen in the in the office, and 58% of them are also seen in retail. So if you wanted to do correlation in retail, it's been very helpful to be able to say, hey, people who are go to the shop, you know, H and M, what other shops do they also go to? Right? We can actually provide that sort of correlation ideas. Uh, and then path analytics. This is a new capability in 10.2 that says, if I'm in the bar area, where was I? Where was the area I was before, and where am I? Where's the area that I see next? So it actually provides you that a concept of a path through a through an area. So it says that of the 289 paths, 9.8% per, came from the office, were at the bar, and then 26% of them went back to the office. Right? It provides you that data points as you walked through an environment. They probably weren't getting much work done at that last. Yeah, if they went from the office to the bar <laughs> back to the office, uh, that second part of being in the office was probably not a lot of work. Uh, presence analytics. So the idea that we were talked about there on presence um, allows you to uh, gather, again, these quick insights. It says, in the last seven days, there were 3,569 visitors. So that means that the APs heard 3,569 different probes from individual unique MAC addresses. Right? We, uh, we often exchange the word visitors and you know, probes from unique MAC addresses, but that's really what it is. And so of those 3,570 unique MAC addresses, the average dwell time was 55 minutes. Again, based on when I received the first probe from that MAC address to when I received the last probe, I then uh, average out all the different dwell times. I can figure out what was the, what was the busiest hour. So again, uh, information that you would get from often much more expensive systems, how like a camera system, I can then now figure out that 2 to 3 p.m. is my busiest hour. So if I need to do any um, type of um, stocking or if I want to do you know, events, I probably don't want to do them during that hour. Are devices that are randomly changing their MAC addresses going to skew these results? So we've actually changed our algorithms to make sure that those, those um, iOS um, devices, MAC addresses, are not included in our devices. We, we skew them. We, we remove those out of our uh, data set. So, so that's only going to take into account those that actually associate. Right. Not, not to associate that, that send non-random MAC addresses. So we okay. can actually determine a bit as to whether or not they're random MAC addresses. And so we're able to do that. Um, and uh, so this is a, a screen of, of um, presence, and you can find things like the top manufacturer. So we've got the presence screen, and then in the um, uh, and then finally in the uh, in the screen, you can actually see uh, the location. So this is kind of the old location screen that you would have seen again in, uh, when we open up to a wider screen. You'd be able to see, but you can see the individual clients that are seen. Uh, each individual client is you know got that X Y location that's determined by triangulating a, uh, based on the individual APs. So we've got the location screen, we've got the analytics screen, and we've got the presence analytics. All right, so that's what I wanted to show you today about, uh, about CMX. Any other questions? We're done? I've got <laughs> All right. I've got oh, oh, no, question. Sam, there's a quick yeah. question at the end. Uh, so, um, you know, we, when we spoke to somebody else yesterday, they, we, they were talking about analytics as well. And, um, you know, I guess my question was revolved around what's the, what's the end game from an analytics perspective? If you've got somebody in the middle watching screens and then making business decisions um, sort of in, in reaction to that, you're, you're, you're bogging down the system. What's the, what's the end game of, of bringing all of the various and sundry analytics from all of the various and sundry systems to automate the, the sort of the business intelligence decisions? Where, where's the Where's the end-to-end -end piece? This is obviously very, you know, this is cool, right? Heat maps and blooms and all that fun stuff. But what do you do with it and, and, and how do you do it? Uh, great question. So I'll, I'll try to be a short, a concise answer to that. But the idea is we really think that um, 
Um, we provide the basis of Wi-Fi and location analytics, where people are. We think that's going to be um, interacted with other parts of it. So that is how much they spent. Are they authenticated? We're going to take other inputs, and we'll run that to a third-party system. So it's, um, Cisco will provide great analytics about Wi-Fi, about where you are. But if you wanted to incorporate other components, we think it's going to be another system. So we are going to provide a northbound notification feed feeds to the other systems. Um, we're doing pure research and development, just like we did on the hyperlocation, to have advanced analytics systems. Right? We're doing a lot of our. We have an analytics BU. We've, we're, we're really uh, focusing a lot on. Um, you know, seeing where that's where that product is going to go, but our you know our our um, shipping products are all about Wi-Fi based analytics um, that we offer today, northbound notifications to third parties to be able to do more consumption and continued research and development and how to get that pre person out of that analytics decision. All right. So on, on the hyperlocation module right now, it's really only working with um, associated clients. Associated right? clients, yeah. Um, when now you look at the kind of the analytics, so a lot of the dwell time and stuff, those are still using kind of because it, because you want that um, non-associated traffic. Yeah, large data sets. Um, that's outside of it. Um, I don't one. I don't. I don't know if you can comment on when that we see the non-associated traffic being aided by hyperlocation module. Mm -hmm. Um, and to, on path analytics, since some of those devices could be associated, if they are. Are those reports aided by hyperlocation module today or no? So a uh, couple of questions. Uh, yeah. The uh, path analytics, <laughs> are they aided by hyperlocation? They absolutely are. What we happens is you get more fidelity in your data points, right? Instead of getting one data point that, hey, he was at the bar, and then the next, next one that he was you know, at the kitchen an hour later, we'll be able to say, oh, he went from the bar to the school to the kitchen. So additional data points gives you better path. Um, you know, like you, when you draw the straight lines, if you have the more data points, you can draw a nice curve. And that's really what hyperlocation gives you, those additional data points that give you a curve instead of just two points in a straight line. And then the, idea, the next idea is, well, can we provide hyperlocation, you know, that angulation um, for unassociated clients? The hard science of that is unassociated guys don't talk a lot. They don't send a lot of packets. You need to have packets to listen to be able to determine the, the angle of arrivals. So that's the, the hard problem that we're trying to figure out. Once we've gotten a good solution to how we can um, provide angles for unassociated <coughs> clients, then we're going to certainly provide that. And I guess where I'm coming from that, from that is maybe not so much like these guys, right? But um, the healthcare environment. Wi-Fi tags, tags. We actually will be the first one. So Wi-Fi tags, because they, even though they're unassociated, but they chirp a lot. They really want to be located. We have a great solution that we're going to be able to offer for, for, for tag solutions that will take advantage of our hyperlocation. Thank you.